and welcome back to Spinal Cast. I'm your host, David Stevens, and joining us today is Dr. Morgan. Dr. Morgan is a senior scientist at the Marine Bio- Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, where she also serves as the director for Eugene Bell Center for Regenerative biology and tissue engineering um alongside dr morgan is our very own peter morton who is executive director of the morton cure paralysis fund both of you thank you for joining me thank you for having us yeah thank you for having us and it's a pleasure to to see you dr morgan likewise wonderful well i would like to kind of kickstart our our podcast interview with a, a simple question and uh Really, why why is it spinal cord injury research for you, uh, Dr. Morgan? Why why spinal cord injuries? Yeah, thanks thanks for that question. Um, actually, the reason that I got involved in spinal cord injury in the first place is very personal to me. Um, I had a friend in high school, Jason Hauser, who um, was injured in a football accident. Um, he had had a shoulder injury and was not cleared to go back in the game and it's sort of a typical story, high school football, you know, maybe he was holding that shoulder a little, uh, in a little funny way. And, um, he, in the second play of the game, he, um, took a hit uh, straight on and was instantly paralyzed. And he, Jason, you know, was a, a wonderful friend who was able to, you know, finish high school and go to college. And once he learned that I was going to graduate school in the field of neuroscience, he asked if I would be able to work on spinal cord injury one day. And I made him a promise long ago that if I had the opportunity to do that, that I would. And so, you know, the reason I got really interested in it in the first place, again, was, you know, out of, um, you know, this personal experience with a good friend of mine and a promise that I made long ago. And so when I had the opportunity to become an independent researcher, it was, you know, really on my mind to try to to tackle that because at the same time I was starting to work in this organism, the lamprey, that um, can remarkably regenerate its spinal cord. So I had sort of the right training and the right model and the personal motivation to get involved. Very cool. Well, you mentioned, uh, you know, you had the opportunity to take on some personal or individual research. Um, what kind of how, how do you wind up there? What what other types of research kind of led up to you becoming the having the ability, I guess, to to do this really focused research? Yeah. So I, you know, I'm a neuroscientist by training. That's what I got my degree in. But my specific expertise is studying how the um, connections between neurons, which are called synapses, how they form and how they're able to release neurotransmitters over time. And so in my, my graduate work, I became kind of a synapse expert. And, um, and so as my own interest evolved, I became really interested in understanding not only how these functional synaptic connections work in the first place, but how might they be restored after an injury and what happens to them with neurodegenerative diseases. So kind of that's how I got into the research um, in the first place, because, you know, at the end of the day, the ability to restore nervous system function will require critically the reconnection of those synapses. Awesome. So then can we dive a little bit further into the work that you're currently doing then? Uh, sure. Just a little bit about, you know, th- why marine biology and how that relates back to spinal cord injury research and neurology and all of that. Absolutely. So I work at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which is a lovely place. And if you haven't been here, please come visit. And, all right. Um, you know, the 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 MBL is a compelling place to do regenerative biology uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, here we are at the ocean and we're surrounded by um, all of these animals in the ocean and in the aquatic environment that are able to regenerate. So unlike humans, marine and aquatic animals can regenerate their nervous system very readily, spontaneously after injury without therapies, without drugs, without intervention. And so, Uh, we sort of reason 
you know, part of the field who does this very basic biological research on nervous system injury repair and regeneration reasons that um, you can learn from these extraordinary animals out in nature that are giving us what I like to call nature's free lessons on how yeah. you can repair the nervous system. And we want to learn if there are, you know, is there one kind of conserved way that they're all doing it? Are there different recipes that successfully regenerate the nervous system? And it's an important, conceptually, it's important to understand that, um, you know, just to give you a few examples, the lamprey, which I study, which is a very primitive vertebrate, can regenerate its spinal cord. Many bony fishes can, of course, invertebrates can. Um, sea star can regenerate a nerve cord. Octopus can regenerate its nervous system. Um, and, and many, many animals out in the ocean can do this. And so it's important to understand that they are using genes and pathways that we have in our bodies to do that. And so, you know, the question is, how can we unlock that potential in the human nervous system? How can we learn about the successful mechanisms of repair and regeneration in these animals and try to understand something about what we are trying, you know, what we're trying to achieve in the clinic? Now, have you been able to realize or understand better why they can do it? And we can't do it. What is the difference between our nervous systems? That's a great question. Um, the The very honest answer is it, it's a difficult question to answer, and I don't have the perfect answer for it. But I can tell you what we've learned that's taken a step in that direction. So you may know that the peripheral nervous system in humans is quite good at regenerating. And, you know, classic examples of that, if you burn your finger and you lose sensation or have a cut on your finger and lose sensation for a period of time, potentially up to a couple of weeks or months, eventually you are able to restore that sensation. And that's as those nerve endings that are damaged can regrow back. And so it's pretty well established now. There's a, a set of... Um, genes in the peripheral nervous system in mammals that's turned on that promotes regrowth. And this has been studied by a lot of our colleagues. Well, surprisingly, what we found out is in the lamprey central nervous system in the spinal cord, the lamprey is actually turning on those same pathways that you see in the mammalian peripheral nervous system. So what that tells us is that um, and, and that particular growth program seems to not be turning on readily in the human spinal cord. And so that's a very interesting um, kind of conceptually, it's interesting that there's an evolutionarily conserved program that is capable of regenerating nervous system structures. And then, you know, but the real question is, well, why doesn't that actually turn on in the human spinal cord or how could we unlock that barrier for for the people at home who might not know exactly what a lamprey is do you want to just do a quick explanation like is it a large fish a small fish a tiny you know oh, sure yeah so so lampreys are very early evolved vertebrates so they've been on this planet for about 600 million years wow. a lot of people think they're eels but they're they're not they're primitive fishes and the larval lampreys that we use for our research that are capable of completely regenerating the spinal cord and recovering function after a, a complete spinal transection are about the size of this pen here. They're not very okay. big. So they're about 10 or 12 centimeters in length, and they're very easy to maintain in the laboratory. And what's, again, remarkable about them is that you can completely transect the spinal cord. And within a few months, they're swimming around again. We published a study a few years ago that indicated that they're also able to burrow again. And so they're able to recover uh, pretty full locomotor behaviors um, to an astonishing degree. Now, have, have scientists been able to determine what the differences are between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system? Yeah, I think right now the field is looking at this from the perspective of, you know, two, um, two different kind of classes of approaches. One is to understand what's happening in the nerve cells themselves that can promote growth. 
And it seems that um, now there's a set of intrinsic factors that can promote growth. These tend to be, you know, fancy things like transcription factors, which um, can turn on whole gene programs. And there's a, a nice list of those transcription factors that appear to be able to drive nerve regrowth um, in many contexts now, in many animals and many types of nervous system. And so I think that's one area where we can start to push forward on achieving better regeneration. And then the other kind of set of factors are, well, what's happening outside of the neurons, what's happening in the extracellular matrix, what's happening in the scar, what are these preventative barriers that are both mechanical and molecular in nature. So for example, one common theme that's emerging from the animal studies or the, the non-mammalian animal studies is that they appear not to form a fibrotic glial scar. Instead, the glia in the lamprey nervous system, and it appears to be the same case in zebrafish and, um, you know, turtles and newts and, you know, salamanders, the glial cells will actually form um, what, what in the field we call bridges, growth, you know, growth bridges across the lesion site. And the nerve cells seem to be growing alongside the glial cells. So in a mammal, the glial cells will form the fibrotic scar in non-mammalian vertebrates, they tend to um, form a bridge, and it's thought that the bridge can help the axons grow yeah. to their Say targets. Say a word, if you will, about the impedance of the scar in, in humans after a spinal cord injury. Yeah, so a lot of people, uh, you know, the the scar that occurs um, in, in mammals and in humans after spinal cord injury, um, you know, the glial cells tend to, you know, come to the injury site and form a fibrotic scar. Sometimes they're releasing molecules that are inhibitory for growth. And also um, this leads to secondary damage due to inflammation, or sometimes the fibrotic score, uh, scar becomes um, uh, ischemic. It can't get oxygen on the inside. So you end up with secondary damage due to, you know, the lack of circulation around that, um, that scarring that leads to, you know, more secondary and longer term damage through, you know, for example, enhanced or prolonged inflammation. And while um, there is a very robust immune response and a glial response in the non-mammalian vertebrates, whatever is happening seems to not be prohibitive for regrowth. And so I think that's another interesting potential is to really understand what the neuroimmune connections are in the vertebrates that are able to regenerate and how that differs in, in the human condition. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of drove you to outside of just, you know, finding this information about the lampreys and their ability to, to regrow these, these cells, um, what, what drew you to, to these types of projects and this type of, uh, of activity um, to, to push forth um, in finding a cure? So the lampreys actually have um, another really interesting feature that we can capitalize on that's um, not really available in other experimental models. And one of those features is that the lamprey nervous system retains some very large neurons. And when I say large, they're, you know, like 10 times or 100 times bigger than the typical neuron in the mammalian nervous system. And so these big neurons are in the same place in every lamprey's brain, and they project their axons down into the spinal cord. And because you have them, they're so big, you can image them, you can record from them physiologically, and you can kind of do detailed um, kind of cell and molecular work on these neurons in the intact nervous system in a way that's impossible to do in other model systems. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to be able to actually visualize the synaptic connections. So we can not only, um, not only do these big neurons regenerate pretty well, and, um, but very interesting uh, is that some of them reproducibly do regenerate and other ones do not regenerate very re reproducibly. And so you have here a system where you can study cell-specific differences 
in regeneration, whether it's um, you know looking at specific genes that are related to the good regenerators or specific genes that are in, you know, turning on or off in the ones that eventually die. So you have this nice right. contrast and you can also image the synaptic connections in the regenerated neurons and you can record from them. And so you have many levels of analysis that you can achieve in this, um, in this animal to look at the cellular and molecular basis within the intact nervous system that's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do in other model systems. And again, I kind of came into it being interested in the synaptic reconnections as kind of the, the starting point. Very cool. Um, so I guess what I would ask is the, the cells that you're talking about are these neurons, these larger neurons um, that you're able to find in Lamprey. Is there worry in the scientific community that findings that you make with these larger neurons won't apply to the smaller ones? Like, is there enough comparison that you can say it's one to one or is there a lot of kind of transitionary work that has to happen? Yeah, thank you for that question, because it's a question that I get a lot and it's really important um, conceptually. So what's really interesting is the the lamprey, even though it's the oldest vertebrate on the planet, remaining on the planet in evolutionary terms. Um, it has 25,000 genes, just like other higher vertebrates, including mammals. And so the, um, you know, the neurotransmitters in the lamprey nervous system are the same as what are, you know, in our body. So glutamate is the major neurotransmitter. They have all of the expected synapse proteins and ion channels. And so there, it's really surprising that there's a very high degree of conservation in terms of the molecular aspects of uh, the lamprey nervous system mm -hmm. uh, compared to humans. Moreover, the specific neurons, these giant neurons that we study are part of the reticulospinal, uh, the reticulospinal tract in okay. lampreys, which is also um, conserved all the way up to humans. And in the lamprey, the reticulospinal neurons are um, responsible for, they're the major initiation command for locomotion that's been taken over by the corticospinal tract in humans. However, um, you know, in, in humans, they do, we do have reticulospinal neurons and they seem to have some synaptic connections out into the arms and hands, which I think we would all um, agree is important um, functionally. And so we, you know, the lamprey nervous system has a very similar wiring diagram to the human spinal cord. So there are a lot of, a lot of similarities from, you know, the molecules and the ion channels to the synaptic connections, the neurotransmitters, the cell connectivity on up to the functional role of these neurons within the nervous system. So there are a lot of parallels surprising number of parallels. So of, of other research going on around the globe that you've come across in readings or in, you know, meetings or symposiums that you go to, um, what global research kind of has piqued your interest outside of, uh, of what your own lab is doing? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, from talking to my colleagues and reading papers and seeing the results, I think there's a lot of promise right now in the field of spinal cord injury with respect to what's being accomplished in neuromodulation. Um, and what I mean by that um, is sort of the, the combination of uh, the epidural stimulation trials that are, are successfully improving um, locomotor function and even standing and walking in spinal cord injured um, individuals. Um, the exercise training and rehabilitation seems to have a lot of promise from what I can see. And I think there's some also uh, new trials that are going on to um, study the how transcutaneous stimulation can also sort of improve the, the tone in the nervous system and all of these sort of stimulator devices. It's all kind of causing, you know, activity of the nervous system and probably the release of um, neurotransmitters that are neuromodulators, perhaps encouraging more um, more regrowth and plasticity of the nervous system. So I think, you know, writ large, the neuromodulation seems to be having a moment 
And um, to me, it looks really exciting. You know, I, th- I, I think it's really interesting and, and as you said, really exciting that uh, we're making that kind of progress that can help people help people now. Um, most of those trials are from the lumbar on down. Uh, they're starting to work a little bit higher than that now. So I'm really curious to see how, the, how those go. Um, but I do get people that call me, people in chairs or family members of people. And one of the questions that they always ask is, why does this take so long? So what's your assessment of the, the kind of progress we've made maybe over the, the last five years or 10 years? Um, and what's your assessment of the kind of progress we're making as you look to the future? Yeah, that's a that's a really important question and a and a great one. I want to actually dial it back to maybe, you know, 20, 25 years ago when I was in graduate school. So, you know, as a as a scientific um, accomplishment and, and movement forward, I, I think the field of neuroplasticity in general has made huge strides since I was in graduate school. When I began graduate school, it was not, this was in the you know mid nineties. We were just starting to learn about neurogenesis in the adult nervous system. We were just starting to learn that the adult nervous system has some capabilities for you know, pruning and sprouting um, beyond making new neurons. The existing neurons can grow and sprout. And we were just starting to see some examples of how injury or um, modifications to, you know, to the body, you know, for example, a, a, a finger or a limb amputation could cause re- functional rewiring back in the brain. And so this was just mm-hmm. coming online. And now, you know, to advance now, you know, to, to have this field advance so far in, you know, in my academic lifetime, scientifically seems really uh, amazing, you know, now that um, it was just not even a concept that you could get an injured nervous system to, to really um, induce enough plasticity to recover any function, m- much less in some individuals, uh, enough function that, you know, they go can go to weight bearing exercises or now even cases of standing and walking. Mm-hmm. So to me, right. you know, scientifically, this sounds very transformational. But, you know, I know from my friends who, um, you know, uh, have, you know, get around in wheelchairs too, that, I mean, this is painfully slow when you're talking mm-hmm. about, you know, your experience mm-hmm. and your um you know, what, you know, the pace that you would like to see. And so I, you know, I think that it's a a big challenge around that is quite honestly, um, there, there isn't as much funding as there could be for spinal cord injury. I think, um, you know, I think this is a, a significant role that foundations like MCPF Craig Nielsen, Paralyzed Veterans of America, and others is really fulfilling that. And what can make research go faster is, you know, like with everything else, put put more money behind it, get more people involved. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the, the mid-90s when you, you started. That's when MCPF started as well. And I really think of those times as the dark ages, pretty much, uh, Almost like we knew nothing back then. Uh, and, and the whole process of research, even though there was research before, we hadn't learned all that much, really. Uh, so I feel like there's been a tremendous amount of progress since then. And my, my question to you is, what's your assessment of where we are on that road? Um, yes, we've come a long way, of course. But what's your assessment of what the next few years look like and how long again this is a question i'm going to get from people uh, that talk to me or call me um and they want to know how long is it going to be well i you know to kind of come back to the neuromodulation idea i think some of these 
new strategies that are being developed that are less invasive are going to be able to push through faster because, you know, again, I am not, you know, I'm not a clinical researcher. That is, you know, not my space. But, um, you know, what I do know is that no neuro, neurosurgeon or neurologist is eager to uh, to have a treatment on a spinal cord injured patient that's going to cause more damage exactly. or cause yep. another injury. And so mm -hmm. I think you know, that's part of the challenge is, you know, there, you may have something that works in, you know, an animal model, but then moving that to humans, there's a, there's a real reluctance to re-injuring the nervous system to get the device in or to, right. um, you know, I, I pursued some experiments or tried to pursue some experiments and very quickly discovered that even having a, a CSF draw would, was, you know, going to be very difficult because of the puncture wound. And so I think we have to, I think that that means that the less invasive procedures can go faster, you know, and, and getting through clinical trial and getting out into the world. And of course, the insurance companies need to respond to that by covering them. So they have to be affordable to people you know, on their normal insurance. Um, it, but you know the other the other aspect of that is that the, the the drug market for spinal cord injury I think has really lagged behind. Good enough, I, if I may, going back to what you were talking about earlier about the risks of um, having someone be further paralyzed or uh, injured in some way by by science. Obviously, that would set back um, research a lot if that were to happen. And yet at the same time, if we look at great human achievements over the years, there's been risk taking involved in that. Um, so I think we need to find a balance between, you know, what is the appropriate level of risk um, to make sure that, that we're actually making progress. And part of what's happening right now, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, but part of what is happening now is people are desperate, of course. And uh, they will go anywhere around the world that get to places that don't have the restrictions that we do, and they will take risks on their own. Um, so, so how do we balance people's desperation um, and the need for some level of risk taking with um, making sure that that uh, we're careful about hurting anybody? Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a really um, you know that's a really tough question too because I you know I, one of the themes that's come up in this podcast before is also you know the injury can be different in different individuals and the location may you know and the extent of the injury may require different strategies and so we do need to build the toolkit but there's also then how comfortable is an individual with, you know, this perspective treatment versus that perspective treatment? And I wonder, Peter, what your, in your role in advocacy, do you think that the, you know, is the system poised to take more feedback from, um, you know, from spinal cord injured patients in terms of what risks people are willing to take? Do you, you know, in your advocacy, do you see the, you know, clinical medicine reaching out to you to ask those questions? You know, that's a great question. And I think, sadly, the general answer is no. Um, I, I don't think that the, the plight, if you will, of the injured is in this equation enough that it doesn't reach the funders as well as it should probably doesn't reach the scientists as well as it should. Um, obviously, people like you are very highly motivated to, to try to find a solution to this problem. Uh, and, and yet there is that, because we talked about, there's that balance between what level, between the risk and reward, if you will, and where is the, the right balance for that. Um, I get, I talk to people all the time who ask me, should I go to Portugal? Should I go to China? Should I go to Mexico? 
Um, and a lot of times my advice for them is at least to tell them something that they may not have thought about, which is if you put yourself into a trial anywhere, that will probably leave you out of any future trial as a candidate because they can't have another um, variable in their study. So just keep in mind that it's probably a kind of a one-shot, one-time shot from a research point of view. Now, if a therapy comes along the road that is helping people, of course, they'll, they'll still have um, access to that. But from a, from a scientific study standpoint, probably not. Um, so I tell them that. Um, I try to educate them as to what it, what's out there. But many times at the end of the day, they're going to make the decision that they will. And um, when you're first heard, especially, there's a desperation. I'll do anything to get out of this chair. Um, so there are people that I think that message needs to uh, be, be in the process more than it is now in an effort to try to accelerate the research. I think I think that's a great point. So I, I got one more kind of main question here that I'd like to ask, um, and that's primarily kind of a jumping back to your research um, uh, and kind of this regeneration uh, of cells and things like that. Are you, um, based on the work you've done thus far, is there a lot of confidence that in the near future you're going to be able to achieve this um, for humans, or are we – still kind of at its infancy and not quite sure if this is going to be incredibly feasible um, in the long term. Or And I guess the last part of my question, which is this is a very long-winded question, uh, is what 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 do you need um, to help you move faster? Uh, I know you mentioned funding is always key to helping things move faster. What, 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 would, what could you get that would help you and your team move faster towards that towards that end? Yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, my answer to this is probably maybe unsatisfactorily somewhere in the middle. I do not think we're at the infancy of this research. I think that, you know, again, just as we were speaking about the advances that have been made generally in neuroplasticity over the last 20 years are quite remarkable. And we may be mm-hmm. at the cusp of um, some things that can really, you know, Peter, as you said, get, you know, get some people out of the chair. Um, at least part of the time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and on the other hand, as we've discussed, each injury and location is very different and each person's genetics and their um, response profiles may be very different. So what we, while we may, I think, be at the cusp of something that can be disseminated within the next, you know, five to 10 years, we, we really need to be coming back up with more tools and the toolkit, because it, it's not going to be, you know, a one size fits all or, a you know, a silver bullet. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's somewhere in the middle. So we really need to just keep pushing on all of the different um, aspects to increase the number of tools in the toolkit that could be applied and learn more about what these individualized responses are. How does the immune response differ in men and women or location dependent, this kind of thing, looking for biomarkers is important. Um, So, and then, you know, to achieve that, I mean, really it's, um, you know, we need to be working together, you know, through advocacy and through our conversations to, to really encourage the decision makers on funding to put more money behind it. We need to encourage um, federal agencies to put more money into spinal cord injury research. Um, You probably know that the state of Massachusetts and other states like um, New York and New Jersey have a spinal cord injury research board program Mm -hmm. that's state funded. So that's also a really a big help to people um, working in the field to support, um, you know, new research that can, you know, lead to, you know, cures and um, right. longer term for funding strategies. So, but yes, more, more money and more people working in the, in this area. Is that something that you think um, is lacking right now is interest in this, in this field in neuro, I'm, I suppose you, you got your background in neurology, right? Um, but is there, 
a, a decreasing number of students that are, you know, picking that field as their specialty? Or are you seeing it just not as much in the spinal specificity um, of that of that field? I, I think the interest is there. I mean, you know, I, I you know, there's a growing number of students and postdocs that I'm seeing that are interested in working in this area and a number of proliferating labs. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the interest is there. We just need to fund it. Mm-hmm. We need to fund it. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Well, perfect. I think that about wraps up all the questions I had. Peter, did you have any other final questions that you'd like to ask? No, I just I just added you. You've heard me emphasizing this with my questions and so forth is to, um, and I know that you do this, but always think, think about the end goal of the research as you do doing your work. Um, the people that are out there that are in chairs holding their breath essentially with hope about the work that you and others are doing. So I appreciate uh, your efforts in that regard and encourage you to stay connected to the to the people in the injury community who you're essentially working for. Thank you. And, and, and we do. And I, I would be remiss not to mention before we say goodbye that the funding support provided by the Morton Cure Paralysis Fund was the first grant I ever got in my independent research lab. Um, the work that was funded by MCPF uh, was later found to hold up in the mammalian system. So my, you know, our work in the lamprey has now been uh, replicated in, in the mammalian nervous system. And so that we have an example of um, how that's, you know, moved forward uh, with a particular target. And, you know, it allowed me to also train other people in my lab in spinal cord injury. And now they are going and they have their own labs. And so, you know, thank you um, to you, Peter, for um for your support of the foundation, for these conversations, and your support of me. Well, you're certainly welcome, and I appreciate your your willingness to be on this podcast. I think it'll. I appreciate all the things that you talked about, and I know that'll be really helpful for our viewers. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Peter, for joining me. If anybody at home is watching us on YouTube, um, there's information about Dr. Morgan in the description below. While you're down there, go ahead and hit the like, subscribe button. Um, And if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, you could always give us a follow. Um, But other than that, I uh, I think that's it. Thanks again, Dr. Morgan, and thank you, Peter. David, thank you much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.